So if we want to see more normal planets rather than cheating, we're going to need to do better. At the moment we were only finding contrasts of a few hundred, anything more than that, and we lost it in the glare of the star. That really doesn't seem very good. I mean, probably do better than that with a normal camera. Surely our telescopes can do better. So what's, what's limiting us? Why can't we do better than... Why can't we see anything that's fainter than, you know, two or three hundred times fainter than the star? Well, let's look up close and personal around a star that you might see. And so this is a picture that a, one of these giant uh, telescopes would look at when you block out the central star. And you see all this junk shining around. And that junk is actually sort of the dust and stuff, the imperfections of the telescope itself. And so the problem is, is that a telescope just isn't sitting there in a vacuum in a place that's not changing. It has to move and follow the sky, the temperature changes, it bends and warps a little bit. So this pattern changes over time. If it was fixed, we could just see what it is and remove it. But it's changing and it changes fast enough that it's very hard to get you know, a real uh, fix on. So it always kind of leaves you with this contrast of a few hundred where you're stuck with. So people were thinking, how can we deal with this? And they came up with a cunning technique called angular differential imaging. Here's the basic idea. Um, as modern telescopes are built like gun sites, here's a time lapse of the Gemini telescope inside its dome. And you can see it's moving around and up and down. Now, as you track something across the sky, like it's doing here, let's say something's rising over there. As it goes across the sky, it might move something like this. Our telescope isn't. Our telescope is always upright. So here's the upright of our telescope, and here's the thing. What it appears as it moves across the sky is the object rotates with respect to our telescope. Now, all these aberrations, these distortion patterns, are due to the telescope, and so they won't rotate. They'll just stay fixed in the frame of the telescope. But where the planet is with respect to the star will rotate, and you can calculate precisely how it will do. So what you can do is take a whole bunch of images as something moves around the sky and then rotate them so the planet, if it is there, should always be in the same place. But that means all the aberrations will not be in the same place. There'll be different angles, so they will largely cancel out. And so you should be able to get a nice clean image only of things that are rotating with the sky and not rotating with the telescope. So you can average out over some of these things in a clever way. Yeah. And here's the difference it makes. So here's the image we saw before. And here's one using this angular averaging technique. You can see it's done a lot better. So it's done, it's done much, much better, yes. So we've not got rid of everything. We've got rid of a lot of the stuff. And this is tried. And in 2008, they hit pay dirt. They were looking at the star HD 8799. This is kind of the opposite of the star we've been talking about so far. Instead of looking around a really little faint red dwarf, this is actually an A star, a massive luminous star. Uh, but despite the incredible brightness of the star, um, you can see the pattern here. But you can also see faint dots, A, B, and, marked A, B, and C. Well, so not A, B, and C, B, C, and D. Don't know what happened to A. Off to the side. And this seemed to be planets. Wow, so there's this, this object has four planets? Well, they found three here. And yep. they went back and reobserved another paper a year later and found another one a bit closer in. Oh, OK. Wow. Now, these planets are pretty bright. To be this bright, given how old the star is, would mean they have to be somewhere between uh, maybe 5 and 15 Jupiter masses. So these are still very big, just below brown dwarf planets. They had to be sure there actually were planets orbiting here, not some sort of background object. The way they worked that out is that, of course, the sun is moving and the stars are moving. And so our point of view on the star is constantly moving. So the star would appear to move across the sky, what's called um, proper motion. And if the planets are in orbit around it, they should be moving with it. You won't see them do their orbits over that yep. a year or so, but they will be moving along with the star. They should have the same speed as the star and not be stuck with the, the, the background stars. But if their background star is much further away, the, the star should move and leave them behind. Yep. So they had to go back and reobserve years later to see these things are all moving together. And it seems they actually are. They've been seen by multiple people. So it looks like these things really are planets. The closest in is 14.5 um, astronomical units out, okay. which is a little bit further out than Saturn is in our own solar system. The other ones go considerably further out. So we are looking at something we haven't been able to see before, really massive things a long way out. A good beginning. It is. And if you remember, we talked about debris disks. The star has a debris disk around it. And it's one of those debris disks which has an inner gap. 
Ah. And the inner gap is just outside where the planets are. So these planets have uh, gone in and uh, cleared out the inner part of the debris disk. And they could be responsible for stirring up the big lumps of rock further out, making them crash into each other to produce this debris disk. Mm. So that all seems to work very nicely. Also, the star is of a curious class, which is very low in some elements um, that form solid grains. It's got heavy elements that don't form solid grains like gases, but things like iron, silicon that form rocks, it's very low on. So it could be that all these heavy elements got stuck in the accretion disk and turned into these massive planets instead of feeding into the star. All right, so this would be under that account. Maybe the star is a little unusual because the star is missing some of these key elements that are in most stars. And mm. that would be maybe a signature to go out and look for other stars that might have such planets. That's right. And if we get to the, the Holy Grail, we can actually measure the spectrum, kind of, of these planets. And okay. um, this is one of them, I forget which. And these circles are the data points, um, and the lines are models. We'll talk about that in a second. And what you can see is an optical wavelength that's not emitting very much, and it climbs up to the infrared, then it goes down, then it goes up, then it goes down. So it's not much of a spectrum. It's really a bunch of data points rather than a true spectrum. True, but that's still a lot more than we've had for any other exercise yeah. on the planet. We actually have a whole bunch of points of different infrared wavelengths. And the fact that it's going up and going down is probably telling us something about what's going on in the atmosphere. So what we need to do is compare these sort of data with a model of the atmosphere of one of these planets. So that's what we're going to talk about next.